Hi, everybody. I'm Ken Kirschenbaum. Thanks for joining us. We have a, a webinar presentation today, and, and we're going to be hosting uh, Jim Worcester, and he is from Alarm Financial Services, which is a uh, operation that lends money to the alarm industry. Um, I happen to like uh, uh, his way of doing lending. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not in favor of a lot of uh, other types of uh, financing uh, that the industry engages in. I think it's overly risky. But I think, I think the way Jim does it, uh, I happen to like it. He's too modest to uh, really tell you about his program, uh, I think, in that way. But uh, I think you're going to find out that what, you, what, what they do is, a, is a, basically a straight loan collateralized by contracts. So you continue as dealer to own those contracts, and after they get paid their uh, uh, monitoring charges over a period of time, the contracts uh, go back to you. Uh, you're, of course, you're the one that's uh, uh, continuing. I think the I think he'll explain it, but you 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 do the billing and you're responsible for the customer and servicing and et cetera. And I, I do understand that it's also, it is recourse in the sense that you have to replace an account if it goes bad. But I think the pro, his program is, is really designed for ongoing operations as opposed to someone who's not uh, continuing in business. So, or, so, so you, you would expect to have replacement accounts. Uh, a, 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 an advantage that you have by going to uh, Jim Worcester uh, and this is not something that they advertise, is that they, that he will do uh, uh, a, an exhaustive analysis of your loan. Uh, so if he makes the loan, you could rest assured that he is convinced that you'll be able to pay it back. Uh, I'm not so sure that that's an analysis done by a lot of other finance operations. Uh, some of them are just happy enough to uh, take your accounts, thinking they've they stole it at, at whatever rate they got it at, but but uh, uh, or some not even care whether you get it back or not. But he does, and and I think that uh, that I like that part of it. Okay, and I see I'm making him very uncomfortable right now, but uh, uh, too bad. Uh, uh, so I'm going to turn this over to uh, Jim, and uh, 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 and also wish his dad well, who who. Uh, uh, made the last presentation along with uh, uh, Jim Jr. So I miss his dad, who's uh, probably uh, with, uh, on a beach somewhere at the moment, but uh, uh, maybe Jim will tell us that too. So, so uh, let me figure out how to, how to make him a, a uh, presenter. There we go. And, and Jim, you are now in control and on your own. Let's oh, see by the I... way, before I wait, before you do take over, let me just say, um, uh, Jim won't. I don't think Jim sees the questions when they come in. I will. So if you have questions, uh, type them in, uh, and I'll be happy to interrupt Jim as he as he moves along and, and present them with whatever questions you might have. If if we get into something where you think you need to have a dialogue with him, then I guess put a hand up, and we'll see if we can unmute you and. And and you can uh, uh, address things that way, but we have we have the next hour, uh, uh, and it's Jim's and yours. So here we go. Jim, you're up. You're up. All right. Let's. Uh, thanks, Ken, first for uh, having me. Let's uh, see if I can pull this off from a technical standpoint. Um, so let me know if you've got the first page of the presentation. We have that. You sell what? Yeah. Yeah. Go for, go ahead, Jim. You're on. All right. You got you got the first page of the presentation. Right. Okay. Good. I didn't know if you had taken over the screen. This is no. the. I, I feel comfortable with our uh, ability as a lender. Technically, you know, a little touch and go sometimes, but we'll we'll do our best here this morning. So. Uh, thanks, Ken, for uh, having me, for having hosting this webinar, and thanks for uh, passing on well wishes to Jim Sr. He's you're 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 right. He's close to the beach, at least uh, in Santa Barbara, uh, enjoying semi-retirement. So I get to do some of the heavy lifting, like presentations, like this morning's, this afternoon's, I guess, for East Coast. 
So this, I think we're going to try to make this as conversational as possible today. I don't really want to necessarily just have this be a reading PowerPoint slides. So I'm all in favor if people want to chime in. Um, and uh, Ken, you want to jump in with any questions that come up along the way. We'll have a few kind of intro you know, slides by way of background. And then you, know, you and I can go kind of back and forth on our thoughts on some of the various financing options that alarm companies have uh, at their disposal today. So just by way of um, sort of background uh, on us, in addition to what Ken has mentioned um, in, in kind words, uh, we provide loans to exclusively within the security alarm industry, and we uh, back those loans, as Ken indicated, through the recurring revenue contracts and accounts that alarm dealers have. That's the collateral for our loans. So we work with fire, uh, uh, security, PERS companies uh, throughout the United States. And generally, we are considered a smaller size lender where we're topping off at loans at around a million and a half or so. Uh, so that's the small to medium size alarm dealer is the mark portion of the market that we we serve, and we're former operating alarm company owners ourselves. So we look at ourselves as um, alarm people that got into the finance uh, uh, side of things rather than finance people that got into the alarm business. So now real quickly, why do alarm companies need capital? I mean, there really isn't anything uh, uh, necessarily different. Uh, than all other industries. All other industries will have upfront costs that they incur in the course of uh, you know, signing customers and bringing on deals, et cetera. And so it may be a gap between when they expend uh, money on equipment or labor and when they get it back. So they're going to have upfront costs. They also, from time to time in their uh, uh, in their day might have acquisition opportunities. And so being able to access capital to make acquisitions is obviously key, key just as in uh, any other company in any other industry. And then expansion, normal expansion, organic growth, opening new offices, hiring people, launching marketing campaigns. These are all drivers in any industry why somebody would need, a company would need capital. The alarm industry though does have an, uh, an aspect to it that is related to creation costs um, which leads to RMR, right? So a lot of alarm companies will expend money in the hope of building their recurring monthly revenue. Uh, it's sort of a subscription model. It's not any different than a magazine publisher, right? They're going to expend money to get subscribers and then enjoy the revenue from those subscriptions. So this is an, an additional aspect above and beyond all the normal reasons why companies would need financing of why in particular alarm companies. Uh, often need financing. So what are some different financing methods that alarm companies will use? Well, self-finance, and that may just be something as simple as the cash flow that they get from doing installations um, is enough to cover their operations, and that's all. They're just become self-reliant. Um, as with any uh, small privately owned companies, relying on friends and family, especially during the startup phases, is, is certainly common. Yeah, from time to time, you know, covering expenses on credit cards is a way that uh, growing companies uh, do, you know, do financing. Private equity. And private equity, I think, has this sort of intimidating connotation to it. Private equity just means somebody who's, you know, has invested in your company. You've gotten uh, uh, equity investment or, ca you know, cash infusion. And really the big difference um, with the different sources of private equity is what those equity providers expect in return, right? So is it a rich uncle who maybe hopes to get their money back 20 years from now when you sell the company, or is it a private equity company that's gonna want a really serious return in a very short period of time or a relatively short period of time? And then there's other types of financing mechanisms out there. I mentioned factoring and um, some people are familiar with that and that's the, um, where you get paid up front on your receivables. So you've invoiced your customers and there's going to be some period of time uh, before you get paid. A factoring company will front you the money on those. Uh, you'll, it'll be at a discount. So you may get 90 cents on the dollar of what you've invoiced. They'll take the other 10 cents. Um, they'll pay you up front. So, you know, these are different kind of creative mechanisms that are available out there to companies, alarm companies and, and all companies uh, for, for raising capital. And then we're going to talk a little bit about traditional banks 
uh, uh, who have long been a resource with for alarm companies. So those are general financing methods that all industries take advantage of. We're going to spend extra time on the industry-specific finance programs and break them down really into a couple of different categories. Dealer programs, which is terminology that a lot of people in the alarm industry are familiar with, and then what I refer to as specialty finance uh, providers. So, uh, you know, I've sort of thrown some logos up here from different industry financing partners. Some of these will be familiar to members of the audience. Some of these won't. Um, I mean no slight if I've left, if there's any uh, financing companies on this call and I've left them off, it's really more uh, probably a result of me not being able to pull a logo off of your website. Um, I'm not going to really talk so much today about these companies specifically, um, uh, but this is really just to illustrate that there are a lot of specialty finance companies that are set up to serve our industry, which is great. Our industry has demonstrated over years and years of predictability and stability that it is investment worthy and lending worthy. And so as a result, we have a lot of uh, financial providers, which is, you know, helps to uh, continue the, the, the success of the industry and the health of the industry. So I mentioned local bank, and, and so I want to, before talking more about sort of specific industry uh, financing programs, I do want to talk a little bit about local banks because they can be a great resource, but there are also some limitations. And a lot of alarm companies will make efforts to reach out to their local bank to obtain financing. So what to know about a loan from a local bank? You know, they're going to be more focused on things like receivables and physical assets these are things they understand. They don't understand RMR necessarily, right? And you can't blame them for that. They can't afford to specialize in every industry out there. They can't be equally adept at lending to a coffee shop and a manufacturing plant and an alarm company. So, you know, they have to kind of, as a result, they'll often set low borrowing limits as a way to just across the board kind of limit their risk. Um, and that's really probably one of the biggest things that we see when we talk to alarm companies is they may have a relationship with a local bank. They rely on them for merchant services and for just general you know, checking accounts, et cetera. Um, however, that bank has set a borrowing limit that's too low and it caps the alarm company on their ability to grow, whether it be organically or to make an acquisition. So we often work with alarm companies that have kind of tapped out with their, their local bank. So I wanna get back now to some industry specific options and um, talk a little bit about, about those. And this is where I think, you know, we're gonna spend the, the bulk of the conversation here today. Um, and, and I'm gonna you know, kind of kick these back and forth with Ken. So first off, I wanna talk about dealer programs and you know, dealer programs are something that have been around in the uh, alarm industry for a, a, a long, long time. And, and certainly there are advantages to dealer programs. Um, you know, they allow an alarm company to focus on marketing, on sales, on installation, and they really really rely on the dealer program, the, the, the parent there to, you know, kind of handle uh, uh, the, the all other aspects there. Um, you know, some of the drawbacks, though, obviously, are your the biggest drawback immediately is if you're selling off accounts through a dealer program, you're not building up recurring revenue yourself. You're not building up your equity necessarily in the business. You're not building up sort of the long term value uh, that comes from establishing uh, recurring monthly revenue accounts in an account base and base of uh, subscribers. Um, so. Dealer programs are going to, you know, operate in a couple of different ways. Most commonly, it's going to be, you know, sort of a monthly or weekly flow of new accounts, um, where a dealer is creating the new customer, sending it in, getting finance, etc. And so that cash flow is funding their operations. Dealer programs will, from time to time, also allow bulk purchases, and so bulk purchases. Um, you know, means you've maybe established uh, some base of in-house accounts and then you just want to sell them in a, in, a, in a block. So, Ken, I want to just, again, sort of maybe kick back to you, your kind of experience, thoughts on these different categories 
and we'll get into um, a little bit more on some of the other ones. So if you, you want to jump in with any of your thoughts about bulk purchases and dealer programs, we'd love to have your perspective. Well, I, I, I do want to uh, say one thing about the dealer programs that bother me. Um, and by the way, we had someone who couldn't hear. I hope you can hear now. You should be able, everyone should be able to hear uh, the presentation. I'm concerned that the uh, real advantage of being in the alarm business, which is the creation of RMR, uh, creating this, this uh, equity position that can one day be capitalized on by, by selling out your operation when you're ready to basically retire or, or if your model is to build and sell, build and sell, that's fine too. But but if you are uh, working for a dealer program and 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 selling them all of your accounts, in my mind, you're simply a salesman to them, an outside salesman to them, and they, they, there's a problem in that, uh, in my mind, because you might you're making a living, you're making maybe a good living, but you're not building a equity position in a business. For the most part, you're you're really losing all, in some cases, or most of those accounts uh, uh, that you've been selling off. So I, I'm concerned about that approach. Uh, again, only because it's not the model that I uh, believe most alarm companies adhere to, uh, and, and 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 have been successful with. So that's my reason. That's my reason for that. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that we often see is um, it's a ch sort of a chicken and an egg situation, right? Um, people come to us and say, "All right, I, I want to get a loan," and, and I'll say, "Well, all right, how how much recurring revenue do you have? How many accounts do you have?" And they say, "Well, I don't have any. I'm starting, but that's why I want to get the loan." And I say, "Well, you know, you need the accounts to get the loan." And they say, "Well, I need the loan to get the accounts." So uh, and there is sort of, especially for you know for, for for startup companies, there is that challenge, right? So you know dealer programs to their their credit, I I like the ones that don't have an exclusivity arrangement, right? Where you have to sell all your accounts through them, and, uh, except for the ones that they reject, right? Because what this allows a dealer to do is to maybe you know, sell one, keep one, sell one, keep one, and then they can start to build their account base, but they're not completely wedded to the dealer program. And so we often will find that we end up working with dealers who have taken that approach and they've grown their account base at the same time that they've participated in dealer programs. So um, so I, I agree with your um, reservations uh, and in some cases, for some, especially startup dealers, it becomes maybe a necessity until they can build a little bit of the base of accounts themselves, and then launch off to something like a loan, uh, a loan with us. So that's kind of you know to sort of maybe give a little bit of um, you know a credit to to what the programs do provide. So also you know there are companies that would maybe fall under the category of a dealer program. However, they're maybe more focused on bulk purchases, right? And so there may be a strategic reason for something like that, in which case, you know, we 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 do see the value in that. For example, uh, you know, over the last several years, we've talked to dealers who have decided that they want to focus exclusively on commercial accounts. They feel that that provides more opportunity with multiple lines of service between Berg, Fire, Camera, Access, et cetera, et cetera. And so, and they figure maybe there's a higher barrier to entry on the commercial side, uh, and they don't have as much price erosion on their upfront uh, charges. So, you know, we've had companies that have looked to sell off their residential accounts. And so that's a bulk purchase that may make a strategic uh, sense to an alarm company. I don't know all the time that a bulk sale of accounts makes a financial sense uh, to that company um, because the idea is whoever's buying them from you figures they're going to get more money out of those accounts uh, over the long haul than they paid you. Why else would they be buying them? 
So uh, really, when we see that as a strategic decision, we, we understand it. Um, maybe a, a alarm companies spread into multiple markets and they want to just focus on a single geographic market. So they sell off the accounts in the other ones. Like I said, maybe it's more of a, you know, I want to keep my commercial and sell my uh, uh, residential. In, in some cases, uh, the companies that provide these bulk acquisition opportunities will also let the alarm company maintain their um, their their uh, brand and their uh, relationship with the customer in order to do ongoing billing of uh, uh, billable service, to do uh, uh, referrals, to pick up referrals, to do upgrades and add-ons, et cetera. So that relationship between the purchaser and the uh, and the seller, the alarm company is, maybe becomes more of a partnership in which they're both uh, providing services to the to the customer. So, but again, as you mentioned, Ken, then what they're doing is they're taking the upfront cash in exchange for the long-term equity that those uh, accounts provide. But again, so that's a, another segment of the funding industry that's out there just focusing on doing bulk purchases of alarm accounts. I want to me I want to mention, if I can. Yeah. I want to mention another reservation that I have on, on lending in general, uh, and that is uh, too many companies don't do a careful enough analysis of what the attrition rate is likely to be over the life of, of, a, of a loan. And they're borrowing money, they're putting up these accounts without, un, without doing a, a careful enough analysis of, of their responsibility to pay back the money. Uh, believe me, as a United States bankruptcy trustee uh, for almost 50 years now, I understand this concept of people borrowing without necessarily giving enough consideration to having to pay it back. Well, almost all of these these programs do require a payback, and uh, it's it's generally uh, adjusted frequently, maybe even monthly, where a bad account needs to be replaced right then and there, and 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 you would be foolish to think that your accounts do not have attrition because all accounts have attrition. So you know that you that in addition to paying back, in addition to having an interest factor, um, uh, you're, you're going to have a, a replacement of collateral that's necessary during the life of the loan. So that, that's, that's a, a consideration. I have one more. I might, I might, maybe I'll throw it in now. So you, unless you prefer to address that, Jim. And, and, uh, well, uh, no. So I, I uh, you're bringing up a, a point that I, I, I would definitely like to talk about, and and that's just uh, as I've just put up the bullet loan against new accounts, right? So there's a couple of different approaches to 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 lending to an alarm company, right? So one, the idea is, all right, this is like a dealer program where I send in new accounts each week or each month and I'm gonna get financed on them. Well, on a dealer program you, where it's, the account is purchased, you get the purchase value of that account that you sent in. But it's a, a similar model um, with lending against new accounts, except instead of getting the purchase uh, uh, value of the account, you're getting some loan value on the account, right? And the idea is on a dealer program where you sell the account, then it's gone, you, you, you're not gonna see it again. Whereas with a loan, the borrower uh, you know, turns the account over to the lender. The lender is gonna bill that customer for some period of time until they've gotten their, their, their principal and interest and fees back. And then they're gonna send, give that account back to the dealer and the dealer can pick up from there. That's the, what you just explained, the, 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 the program, type of program you just explained. And you're absolutely right. Well, when the lender lends against that account, they have a certain expectation of how long they're gonna keep that account in order to get their principal and interest and fees back. And if that customer cancels before that's happened, the dealer is on the hook to provide a replacement account. So yes, now, but, but, no, wait, but don't kid yourself. Some of the dealer programs where you're turning over your accounts, essentially selling them, those require replacement too. So you right. are you are you are uh, uh, getting a loan. You are you are turning over an account, let's say, and let and, and maybe your deal in this dealer program is you're turning over this account and they're going to keep it for 36 months. 
they expect 36 monthly payments after which they'll give you they'll assign it back to you okay but if there's a breach during that 36 month payout you're on the hook and how are you on the hook well either you're going to replace that account or uh, you're going to be charged back i can't tell you how many clients call me and tell me i'm at the end of the line of this program and they're hitting me with huge chargebacks that the program has allowed to accumulate over a period some period of time and and which becomes substantial at the end so that's a, that's a that's a very careful consideration agreed completely you said you had another topic okay that... i i have another another problem with some of these programs uh um and, and i know that this is not a problem that you have with uh, jim's program which is so I'll, I'll mention it some of these programs require you to use uh contracts that they insist on you using rather than your own this is a problem if those contracts do not meet what I'll call industry standards. You've heard me counsel many times that uh, uh, your contracts are your most important asset. And one of the reasons they are is because they, they, they will protect your company, they protect you. Uh, that's a very important feature of these contracts. If you are compelled to use uh, 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 paper, documents, contracts, uh, furnished by your finance company uh, that don't meet industry standards for protection because they're focused almost exclusive or exclusively on truth and lending issues uh, a compliance uh, compliance so that the lender can sue the customer uh, leaving you completely out in the cold so where, where does that where does that uh, happen well, let's say you do an installation and there's a mistake in design or installation and there's a lawsuit that comes out. The, you pull out the sales contract that you've got that the finance company provided you with, and guess what? It doesn't have any of the contractual protection that you need to defend yourself. You are stuck in a, in a, in a lawsuit without contract protection doesn't mean you'll lose, but it will mean you're in for protracted litigation instead of a, 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 uh, a much easier way of defending yourself. So you need to be concerned about that. So it's not just build up of equity that, be, that you need to be concerned about. It's, it's protecting the rest of your business as well from potential claims that may arise. You have to make sure that whatever paperwork you're, you're required to use, if, if that's the case in the particular program you choose, that those contracts are acceptable to you. You have to think beyond, let me just get the loan. I'll, I'll, I'll use whatever I need to use to get that loan. Just give me the paperwork, I'll go out and get it signed. Well, you better think beyond that because the consequences could come uh, well beyond that. That's the final point I had. Well, yeah, and I think this illustrates sort of a, a fundamental difference with the way we and and um, industry, other industry lenders that are more like banks, right, or and are actually banks, uh, approach it, right? There's this idea of financing the the contract or financing the customer, financing the account, right? That individual thing, as opposed to our approach and industry banks' approach is to finance the company. Right. So we don't look at it like, OK, send us 10 contracts and we'll finance those 10 contracts. We look at it like, let's learn about your company. Let's look at your financials. Let's look at your history. Let's look at your growth. Let's look at your attrition. Let's look at uh, your your profit margins and let's make a loan to your business uh, as opposed to making a loan against a stack of contracts. Right. So I think it's a sort of a fundamentally different approach. And because we take that approach about lending to their business, right um this idea of them controlling the contracts the dealer controlling the contracts that they use 
that's perfectly fine with us. Of course, we're going to look at them and make sure that they are sound industry contracts. And if they've been provided by your firm, it doesn't take us long to come to that conclusion. So we're going to, of course, that's going to be one of the qualification processes that we put them through. Um, but I think that's a fundamentally different approach, right? Are you financing the contract or are you financing the company? And we're financing the company. Um, so, but what you've brought up definitely comes up with this next category, uh, and that's consumer financing. So, consumer financing is something that's been around forever in different shapes and, and forms in the in, in the industry, and it's the same model that when you go into uh, Best Buy, and I, I think they still do this, right? I don't know. I haven't bought any appliances recently, and you they present you with an option to finance that over over time. Now. That's sometimes an in-house finance company, if, if, if it's Best Buy or whatever, but sometimes it's a third-party finance company. And so in the alarm space, what we've seen over the last few years is a real big growth in this segment of the financing uh, offerings with, of consumer financing. And I think it's really been um, in response to demand from dealers who have been in dealer programs and have decided they don't want to keep selling their accounts and not build their, their RMR equity. So what a consumer finance uh, offering allows a dealer to do is kind of separate the two components of the customer relationship. So there's the sale and installation component, and then there's the ongoing monitoring and service component. And so the consumer finance company will provide financing on the former part of that, right? So they will fund the dealer on what the dealer wanted to charge the customer for the sale and installation of that system. And the customer will pay the finance company some amount of money for some period of time to cover that. And then separately, the alarm dealer will have a monitoring agreement with the customer. So the customer may be paying two bills. Maybe they're paying $35 a month to the alarm company and $35 a month to the consumer finance company. And after some period of time, the $35 a month to the consumer finance company stops after they've paid it off, and now they continue just paying their $35 to the alarm company. So this has sort of been looked upon by a lot of dealers as a nice alternative to, okay, I can get some upfront funding to cover my creation costs without losing that monitoring RMR relationship and equity. So again, it still has to face the, the scrutiny that you're bringing to the table, Ken, about, well, what contract are you using and what protection are you getting? But from a financing standpoint, that's the need that the consumer finance program is, is, is attempting to meet. So I'm not sure what your thoughts are on that, um, furthermore on that segment. Well, I had no further thoughts on it. I said what I wanted to say. You can, you can. All right. All right. All right. So uh, let's see. So then, you know, kind of, um, you know, getting into, I think, what a little bit more of what we do from a traditional uh, line of credit or, or term loan. Well, you skipped over your, you, you, you put it up oh, on your uh, presentation. Right. You, I skipped commercial lease. Okay. You put, you so, put commercial uh, leasing, which, which, by the way, which, by the way, I, I, I can tell you that when I get, when a client would call and say, you know, they're thinking about borrowing in order, or they're, or they're doing uh, uh, deals where they're giving every other account to a, to a dealer program, I've, I've said to them, listen, you need to bite the bullet, at least temporarily, and start leasing, which, which is essentially in, uh, house financing. You're financing yourself by entering into these lease agreements. And, and I've, I've suggested to them when they, when they raise concerns that, you know what, you can almost get the same installation fee that you're gonna get when you sell the system. So it's it, it almost comes out pretty close. You should be able to balance uh, a sale and leasing uh, uh, so that you can stay, have, have a sufficient cash flow to operate. This doesn't answer the question of acquisition, which, which in an acquisition, yes, you 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 might need to to borrow funds, uh, and and that's a diff that's a different situation than ongoing operations. Right. So the commercial lease option, I think, provides a, a, a lot of interesting aspects to it, right? And we when we were operating 
uh, alarm companies, we really focused a lot on providing leases to the customers. However, what we did was we held those leases in house, right? And uh, and and that's that's I think what you're talking about and where you're trying to you know push dealers in that direction. And so what we'll do is we'll see a lot of times dealers want to be able to provide their commercial customers with a purchase option and a lease option. It's from a sales standpoint, it helps them, puts them in a position perhaps to win more deals because if they're presenting an offering that fits better into their customer's budget, right? They might not have the budget to buy, you know, the $75,000 commercial fire system outright, right? But maybe they can pay $20,000 upfront and then some higher monthly amount. So this is a great tool to build larger RMR, to really amplify RMR with commercial customers. But again, the key there is, well, are you holding that in-house or are you flipping it to a leasing company and then they're going to kind of get the benefit of that, right? So there's pros and cons to each approach, but there are leasing companies that specialize in the security industry. So they come in and they can properly, you know, value what the cash flow stream is going to be on a you know commercial camera system or commercial fire system, et cetera. So they specialize in in, uh, in our industry. And that can be an option, right? Do you have a huge commercial opportunity and you're you you know in order to win the deal, they're looking for some sort of a lease option and you can't finance that in-house, you can th turn to a third-party leasing company that would do that, and that can help you, you know, win the deal. Um, but again, so commercial lease has to be viewed in two ways. One, are you using a third-party leasing company? Or two, are you sort of holding that lease in-house? So I know your contracts take that, that lease option in-house, so I'm hoping maybe you could talk a little bit about that, and then, you mentioned earlier, Ken, you said, well, some dealers expressed concern to me about it. And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about what concern they mention when, when they're expressing reservation about doing leases. Well, the, the, the question is, can you get the same amount leasing as you can selling? Uh, you, you, you picked a particularly interesting uh, the scenario with a $75,000 installation. Uh, so, so it's not likely you're going to get a $75,000 installation fee uh, when the sale of the of the equipment would be $75,000. You're right. You said maybe you would get $20,000 on that one. Mm -hmm. um, the the uh, uh, commercial leasing or residential also, but it's more much more common in commercial leasing, has a couple of favorable uh, uh, reasons for doing it. One is the customers like it because they can expense the lease payment. They don't have to uh, treat it as a capital improvement in, in, in what they're doing or capital investment and where they have to depreciate. They get to, they get to write it off. It's a, it's a lease. Similar reason for why you, why a business would lease a car as opposed to a, 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 a personal uh, lease on a vehicle, which you don't see that much of. Um, uh, the other thing is, but alarm companies like leasing equipment because it, they own that site at that point. Uh, it's particularly uh, it, uh, significant for fire alarm systems, where uh, fire systems are, are mandated by law, or building owners must have them, they must have them inspected, continuously monitored, uh, and, and here they find that, uh, uh, that the alarm company actually owns the entire installation. If they want to switch alarm companies, they need to a deal with the problem of having to replace that fire alarm system if, they, if that's the position the fire alarm company would have. Also, we have in, in our leases, in, in, the, in the fire all in one leases, we would put, if, if a customer was going to buy a $75,000 fire alarm system, then that, uh, 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 that lease would provide for an equipment value of one hundred and fifty thousand, two hundred and twenty-five thousand valuation, uh, and and uh, in the event of of the customer uh, breaching that agreement or upon termination of that lease, by the way, 
uh, the alarm company would have the option of selling that equipment to the customer. Mm -hmm. So that is a big, could be a big windfall for the alarm company. And we've justified it uh, by saying, look, alarm companies enter into these fire alarm leases and they don't expect them to end. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it's a 10 year uh, 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 contract, 10 year term on that lease, they don't expect it to end because there's no reason for that fire alarm to be replaced as long as that building stands and doesn't need a, a change in the fire alarm system. As a matter of fact, uh, building owners would find out and alarm companies who do this know that um, uh, fire alarm systems get grandfathered so that so that uh, uh, a building owner uh, says to someone, I'm going to I'm going to rip your system out, and put another fire alarm in. Well, guess what? When that f new fire alarm company comes along and has to file plans and specs, they're going to find out they need today's standards, not standards from 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago, as long as that building hasn't changed. So that's that's another advantage of of, of the commercial uh, lease. You own that you own that site in in a sense. Right. Well, a lot of um, companies come to us in order to tap into uh, capital in the form of a line of credit so that they can get into the business of providing leases to their customers, right? So what they want to do is, I use that example of that $75,000 if it was an outright sale, or maybe they structure it so that it's you know, $20,000 up front and then some several hundred dollars a month for, for the lease. So the company may be selling that system for $75,000, but their cost on it, let's just say it's $50,000, right? So their cost is 50, the, the extra 25 was gonna be their profit on the job. They, they are gonna get 20 up front from the, from the customer uh, on, a, on a lease, but now they've got the other $30,000 in cost that they have to, how are they gonna cover that, right? Well, if they don't have an extra $30,000 sitting around, that's why having a line of credit with the funding with a, a company like ours um, would 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 help them because now they can borrow the thirty thousand that they need to cover their costs. Now they have this very high, open-ended RMR, in which you've articulated the value of, of, of something like that. They've won the deal, so now they have this you know great high RMR, high value, which because that's open-ended, let's also not forget when it comes time that they want to sell their company, <clears throat> the buyer is in all likelihood going to provide the same multiple on that that portion of the RMR as they are on the monitoring portion of the RMR. Um, or, or even higher, because if you think about it, there's no cost associated with the, to, the, to the buyer with that RMR that's associated with the lease. Um, as there would be with a portion of the RMR that's associated with monitoring. So it's a great, great, great profit and equity um, uh, mechanism, but it needs the capital behind it, right? And so that's where a line of credit or, or a, a loan would come in from an industry lender who understands what the alarm dealer is going to go do with that money, right? And, and so this is one of the common uses uh, for companies that come to us and want us to have lines of credit is so that they can launch or facilitate the growth of, a, of an in-house leasing uh, uh, program. Um, so, so again, kind of segueing into other reasons why uh, uh, companies, alarm companies would look to borrow uh, from, a, from an industry lender like us, um, you know, fundamentally, they have this asset uh, sitting in their company in the form of their RMR accounts. And so it's an asset that they can tap into and, and leverage. And to not do so is just leaving it just kind of, uh, you know, you know uh, idle. I mean, it provides certainly the great cash flow and it provides the equity at the time of a sale, but why not also tap into it for, for growth? So for us, the most common reason that we're getting approached these days for loans, uh, I would say over the last couple of years has been for acquisitions. There's just a lot of activity in the small to medium size segment of the industry as it relates to acquisitions. Um, there's a demographic element occurring where alarm dealers have reached an age where they're looking to sell and, and retire and get out. 
and there's this segment of younger alarm companies that are looking to grow and they've been growing organically but they want to augment that organic growth with acquisition growth and so these two uh, uh, elements are coming together and it's fueling a lot of acquisition activity that that we're seeing and we're being involved in i can't speak to the large end of the market but certainly in the small to medium size side of the market this has really been very active for us over the last couple of years. How do you how do you view and deal with that transaction, potential transaction, when when a potential uh, a buyer uh, comes to you and says, I, "I'm looking to buy the, these accounts, and mm -hmm. I want I want to borrow money from you." So, right. what is your analysis, if any, that you would do to to uh, evaluate that? And have you have you have you ever had to turn to a potential customer of yours and say, you know what, this purchase makes no sense to me and mm -hmm. I'm not going to finance you? Uh, we, yeah, we, we definitely have. One of the most common reasons for that is when it's a small company trying to buy a company that's much bigger than theirs, right? So that becomes a challenge financially uh, uh, to pull that off. I mean, it's a challenge operationally, right? If you have 500 accounts and you want to buy a company that has 2,000 accounts, just operationally to, to you know, increase your company overnight by, you know, a factor of five is, is, is daunting. Um, but from a financing, financing standpoint, that also becomes a, a challenge. That's, that's the main reason why when those opportunities come up, we, we, we find, um, sometimes it doesn't work out but sure the you know fundamentally i said we lend to the to the company uh so we're going to look at their financial strength uh their rmr that they already have but then we're also going to take into consideration the quality of the rmr accounts that they're buying so we as a lender perform our due diligence on both businesses both the buyer and the seller and so the buyer benefits from that because we have a vested interest in analyzing the seller's attrition, payment history, contracts, uh, you know, central station activity, et cetera. And they get the benefit of our due diligence, which we're doing kind of out of our own self-interest, make sure we're financing uh, you know, a quality acquisition. Uh, so, so yeah, we're gonna sort of work side by side with them to approach that acquisition from both a, a operational uh, analysis as well as a financial analysis. Here's a question that you have. What advice would you give a company who's trying to calculate an accurate creation cost? Right. <laughs> so there's a lot of different angles on this and you, you could go way, way, I think too far in depth. And I, and I should have mentioned, you know, earlier on, creation cost is something that I think is too often overlooked. There's a lot of sort of training of alarm of young alarm companies that that takes place through their participation in dealer programs, and so those dealer programs are really focused on growth and volume, right? That's what they want their dealers to do: growth and volume, as opposed to really scrutinizing, well, what are their creation costs? And so creation costs, I mean, if you look at it on the most fundamental, it's all right, how much did it cost you to obtain that, to, to, to obtain that customer, right? So you, what did it cost you for the equipment? What did it cost you for the sales commission? What did it cost you for the installer's time, right? Uh, and those are the, obviously the three fundamental things. But you also got to put into that equation, well, what about other marketing expenses that you had? What about your you know, operational people who have to onboard that account? What about the fact that out of one out of every five installations, there's a go back because you know, something happened or something didn't happen or somebody else needs to get trained? All of these things, I think, can go into creation costs. But at the end of the day, when, if you take a look at it and your creation cost is starting to approach the value of the account itself, then you have to think, well, what am I doing this for, right? I'm spending just as much money to create this customer as what it's worth, <laughs> right? So that's why uh, companies that have really high creation costs, um, it, it, it sort of paints you in a corner. You don't have a lot of financing options because for a company like ours, we would look at a really high creation cost and say, where where's the value here, right? Um, so I don't know if I've answered that 
that question completely. But you know, creation costs is one of the biggest things that we find when we're talking to dealers, especially those who are used to being in dealer programs, that they, you know, if if, if everything is is lost in pursuit of just signing another customer. Um, you know, I, I don't know that it, that makes sense, and it's hard to get off of that dealer program treadmill uh, if, if if that's the case. Well, is it is it easier to, to I guess in a sense I hadn't thought about it, but in a sense <clears throat> it's easier to calculate your creation cost if you're buying the account. You know exactly what your creation cost. This this account cost me a thousand dollars to buy. I just bought this account for a thousand dollars. That's what right. it cost me. Okay, and that that's a multiple blah 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 whatever it's maybe 30 times 35 times whatever it was okay and I and I went to Worcester and I borrowed it's got 26 times as I borrowed some of it I had some of it myself and now I own this account I paid a thousand bucks for it that's my creation cost okay right. so the question is is it fair to say well that account had otherwise it would have no creation cost of course not you would have had to buy equipment install it uh, 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 you would have had advertising expense, maybe that's how you do. It. So if you if you if you if your business is through acquisition, you know your you sort of know your acquisition your, your creation costs. Don't forget to add legal on there, and mm -hmm. and and then you've got you've got your uh, 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 if, if you're not buying accounts, then 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 you're then you're developing it through maybe advertising or whatever whatever you're doing plus cost of install and whatever, but it's so it, it would I've never thought about this but if you were to do an analysis and and this account you know you could buy this account for a thousand bucks from somebody else would you say that the creation cost comes pretty close to that same number yeah I mean you can make the argument right you say well listen what's the difference I'm gonna spend a thousand dollars if I buy the account or my thousand spend a thousand dollars creating the account organically and and companies will come to us and say well, you know, if, if I'm doing spending a thousand dollars or whatever the number is, either way, you know, um, I'm not inheriting somebody else's problem. If I do it through an acquisition, I can create the customer that I want, right, and get them with my equipment and my contract and my, you know, quality of installation. So that's the argument that can be made, and and that's fine. But you know, a lot of the times, what we find is that you know companies can only grow so fast organically right they can only get so you know get towards their ending goals so quickly through one account at a time so unless I don't, unless, unless, unless you've got uh, uh, contacts in Utah <laughs> so listen there's been a lot of, of, uh, of innov effective innovations in our industry over the years and so uh, uh, certainly, you know, mass market has been one that's got some pros and some cons to it. Would this be a whole different webinar, I'm sure. Um, but the, 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 I think the point being that it isn't always just one or the other, right? Am I either going to create organically or am I going to do acquisitions? For a lot of dealers, it's a combination, right? They're going to keep going with their organic growth, but at the same time, look for acquisitions that make sense, um, you know, strategically because they're in their area or for any number of, of reasons. So we don't always look at it as a one or the other. I think a, a, a smart combined strategy of organic growth and acquisition is what, when you look at these companies that are, you know, sort of in the upper, you know, sections of the SDM 100, they're getting there through a combination of organic growth and, uh, and acquisition. Um, so, so one, one other thing I just want to, you know, kind of mention is when it comes to lending in the alarm space, we're, we're fortunate that there are a lot of banks that have um, dedicated uh, divisions that specialize in the security industry. So there's a lot of knowledge out there um, uh, from, from lenders that specialize in, in, in the security industry, which I help, I think helps lend to the stability of, of lending because you, you know they're making informed, smart loans, right? They understand alarm companies. They've been looking and lending to alarm companies for many, many years. And so what, what lenders don't want is to lend money out there and have loans go bad. And nobody wants that. That's bad for our industry. It's bad for attracting outside capital. It's bad for valuations, et cetera. So I think we've been um, fortunate to have a lot of industry uh, banks that have these 
uh, knowledgeable, experienced uh, specialists, and 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 so um, it's good because it provides a lot of options for uh, alarm companies as they get bigger. Right? They outgrow um, a loan with us. They 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 need to borrow more than a million and a half or two million dollars. They have some place to go. So um, so we're sort of a we fit in below that segment, but there's a host of banks that uh, can take over after somebody outgrows a loan with with AFS. So. Um, but, you know, really, uh, th that's kind of covers the items that I wanted to. So I don't know if we have any you know, questions or, Ken, some other things that you want to hit on as well. There's what, one question that's asked. Uh, they, they asked top three ways to lower that cost, I, I guess, creation cost. I don't know if you can address that or not. Uh, well, one thing I should have mentioned is the creation cost is really the net, right, between what you're spending to create account and then what you're getting from the customer up front, right? So it's it's two different things. If you spend $800 on equipment and sales commission and labor for a residential system, that's your cost, and you get $499 versus if you get $99, right? So, um, so, so I think it, what are the top three ways to lower uh, creation costs, charge up front for the for the installation in the sale. That's the number one way, right? Because your equipment, yeah. what are you going to do? You negotiate a 5% discount on your equipment. What are you going to do with your sales commission? What are you going to do with your labor costs that I'm sure are going up, right? So where can you have the biggest impact? Sell value, you know, sell why that customer should be paying you more than $99 up front for a system. Okay. I think I have to, uh, uh, let me see if I can figure this out. Okay, now I have my screen up and not yours, but I think you can still be seen and heard, I think. Anyway, I, haven't, I don't have any other questions at the moment and we are approaching the hour. I wanna thank uh, Jim for his presentation, knowledgeable for sure, uh, and uh, uh, I hope you all learned something from it and got something out of it. I want to thank you all for attending. Uh, we had a nice turnout, uh, uh, even though COVID's almost over, uh, at least in the Republican states. And um, uh, Jim, I had to throw that in, I'm sorry. Uh, Jim's in San Francisco, uh, uh, outside of San Francisco. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, Jim, I want to thank you again so much for your presentation and ev again, everybody for attending. If you have any other questions about financing or needs, please contact Jim directly. He is listed in the alarm exchange underneath the, uh, the financial section. Uh, so you'll find him there, uh, uh, as well as uh, probably ads all over the place, I would imagine. Uh, uh, but he's readily available and uh, easy to deal with and uh, has my full, full confidence and endorsement. Thank if you. That Ken. means anything to anybody. Okay. It does. <laughs> okay. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you again, Jim. Final Thank word. You. Just. To... Okay. Appreciate I'll it. Out... I'll figure out how to close this out then. Okay. So long, everybody. Thanks again for attending. Anytime. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate the forum. All right. Bye bye. Got to figure out how to close this out. Ha, 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 ha.